So last couple of weeks we've been talking about and, and preaching a, a series called This Is Us. Because what I found is that before we can go where we're going to go, we really have to know the plan. We need to know the strategy. We need to know who we are as a body of believers, who we are as a church. Because we have a lot of different people from a lot of walks of life here in this room. Not everybody has the same testimony. Not everybody has the same story. But with God's help, we can all be on the same page as we move forward. So two weeks ago, we talked about the mission of the church. And we're going to say that right now all together with one accord. The mission of Lima First is to make, deploy, and multiply mature and equipped Christ followers. In other words, we are going to live on purpose. I want you to say it again, and I want you to say it like you mean it this time. Give me a, give me a little boost right here today. Can you help me out? Here we go. The mission of Lima First is to make mature and equipped Christ followers. We will live on purpose. So that's our mission. That's our mission. But the vision that we talked about last Sunday is just some areas and just some ways how we're going to accomplish that mission. The vision will accomplish the mission. And there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. But the first one is we want to establish a family environment. A real family of God will love deep and they'll forgive fast. How many are sitting next to someone in this room or maybe they're across the room that you've had to forgive? See, no one wants to do that. Are they talking about me? This isn't Facebook, friends. We're in a safe family environment, right? How many have ever had to to forgive Larry of something? No, don't raise your hand on that. Listen, we want to establish a family environment. When people come in, we want people to feel, feel welcome. When you have guests come to your home, I always, I always tell people that come into the, my house, listen, our home is your home. You're welcome here. When you go in there, you need to give people refrigerator rights. Right? Refrigerator rights. We want to establish a family environment. The second is we want to create and maintain a climate where Christ is honored, right? The presence of the Lord is, is, we want to create that, but in order to create it, we've got to also make sure that it's maintained. Creating something is one thing, but maintaining it is another. In other words, we have been praying and we've been seeking God and we've been believing God that the very point, the very moment when you drive up onto this, this, this property, You step out of your car, you step onto holy ground. We believe for the very first moment, and we walk through the parking lot, we pray. I prayed. We're believing that the very moment you step foot on this ground, you will encounter him. Not just in here, but on this. How many believe that there is such things called holy ground? Remember the song, we are standing. That's where that came from. God responded to that song. Right? Did the Gaithers write that song? Pastor Lori wrote that song. She's going to claim it. All the royalties go to her. All right? So we want to create and be able to maintain that climate. And number three, we want to offer and encourage opportunities for spiritual growth. Can I tell you, that's probably one of the hardest things. I don't think it's hard to call upon the name of the Lord and his presence comes in. It's just, I mean, you, you, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into me. And you, can, you can create that climate. You can, you can create an atmosphere to where you love people. But, man, this last one is rough, and it takes work. It takes work to provide opportunities and get people to grow. Because for Americans, many times we're just, we're surface people. We like the appearance of something. Do we not? We like to have the appearance of something. Someone said this, that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. And someone said, hey, you know what, Pastor, I heard this just the other day, 
That is true, but you can also put salt in their oats and make them thirsty, and they'll go to the water and drink. So we're trying to salt your oats, right? It's called the breakfast of champions. But today what I really want us to get to is I want to talk about our values and what we value here at Lima First. Now, a value, I'm going to look at the verb and then we're going to look at the noun. The verbal, the verbal, the, the, the explanation of the word value in a active sense is an estimation or an estimate of monetary worth. You like to see, how many watches those shows that they go through like the antique and, oh, you have a 20th century, you know, whatever, and, and it's, a, it's a frog pen, and this was, made by, uh, this was made by Alexander the Great, his son, Hercules, and this was used in the Battle of Armageddon uh, back in the day, and now this pen, as it sits here, it's not perfect, but it's worth $17.5 billion dollars. And they're like, oh, I'll never get rid of that. You're going on eBay tomorrow, and you're going to sell that sucker. Don't lie to me. You're going to sell that. It's an estimate of monetary worth. To value something is to consider something to be important or beneficial. To value is to have a high opinion of something. But let's look at the noun. To value means importance. It has a worth. It's useful of something. To value has a principle or a standard of behavior. Or to value is one's judgment of what is important in life. It doesn't have to do just about having a numerical or a monetary value to it. How many have something, maybe it's on your person even today, that it's not worth a lot of money, but it's very, very valuable to you and you cherish it? This watch, it does not keep time. It just does not. My, my grandfa- grandfather, my grandmother bought this for me a, probably about 27 years ago, right when we first got married. And it's those kinetic watches that's supposed to move, you know, with your, it, it's supposed to wind up as you move. Well, I've had this thing, and I've gone swimming in it, and I've gone to the depths of the ocean and you know, scuba diving, and I had my watch on because it's, you know, that's what it's supposed to do. But today, after all these years, this watch is almost near worthless. And its value is, but it's very, very important to me. Not because of what it can do, but because of where it came from. Right? So do you have something that's very, very important to you that it may, may or may not be worth a lot of money to? And that's what I want us to talk about today for the next few moments and what we value at Lima First Assembly of God. The first one is this. It's not going to be any surprise to you. We value the presence of God. Guess what? Newsflash. I can't save you. I can't heal you. I can't deliver you. I can't change you. I can challenge you. But all those other things are up to God. And we have to have his anointing and we have to have the power of his presence every time we walk on these grounds and God-given grounds, whether it be here in the parking lot or way in the back 40, right? His presence has got to be our purpose in everything that we do here. We want to honor him, not dishonor him. Everything that we do, we honor God and we value the presence of God. We've said it and we're going to continue to say it. His presence, the presence of God, is our purpose is our purpose in everything that we do. We can read this in Exodus chapter uh, 33. We're going to actually look at verse 11. 
But the story goes, when the children of Israel were, were in the wilderness and they were wandering around, the Bible says that during the day there was a cloud that led them, a pillar of, of clouds that led them by day, but a pillar of fire by night. So whenever that pillar, whether it was a cloud or a fire, would lift up and move, they would pack up and they would follow his presence no matter where it went. Well, when it would settle, Moses would go outside the camp and he would set up a separate tent and they called it the tent of meeting. So when that tent was there and that pillar of fire or uh, a smoke or clouds was there, it would settle in. That would mean God's in the house and Moses would make his way out to the tent of meeting and he would go in. Well, Joshua, son of Nun, went with him. And as they were doing this, all the children of Israel were watching at a distance. That's where the song from Bette Midler came from a distance, right? So they were watching from a distance. If you believe that, then you're way off base right now. So they were watching from a distance. They were fearful. They didn't know what was going to happen. But they were worshiping God nonetheless. And we pick up Exodus chapter 33, verse 11. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. And afterwards, Moses, after he got the word of the Lord, he would return to the camp. And then it says this, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent. Why did he remain behind? Because of the presence. That's why many of you, when we come in here and we're worshiping God, we come to an altar, that's why many people don't want to leave because they're in an atmosphere where the presence of God resides, where he dwells. That's why we don't want to leave. That's why we linger out in the hallways because the presence of God is here. And that's why it has to be our purpose. His presence has got to be our purpose. In Psalm chapter 16, verse 11b, it says this, In your presence there is fullness of joy. It's a pleasure to be there. It's not, it's not awkward to be there. Wherever there's joy, wherever there's peace, wherever there's fruits of the Spirit, it's, it, it's exciting to be there, Matt. It's exciting to be there where, where God re- remains and resides. And that's why we value the presence of God. Who's with me? You value God's presence. Amen. Number two, what else do we value here at Lima First? We value missions. In other words, our heart just isn't right here for Allen County and Lima and Bath Township proper. Our heart is global. Our heart is global. My wife and I, we just got back several weeks ago from from Tanzania, Africa. We were in the West Kilimanjaro district. And we were pouring in and praying over pastors and watching them weep at the altars and ministering to people who could not speak our language. They just did not know what we were saying. They didn't know. But can I tell you, God is the one that unifies us. They need Jesus just as much as we need Jesus. And that's why for Lima First, we love people. Missions is one of our core values. Look at it in Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, uh, 9 through 11. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every, everybody say every, every knee should bow, on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and what's that next word? Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In other words, we're supposed to go. That's why missions are so, so very important. Whether it's here, serving food to the less fortunate, or whether it's around the other side of the world preaching the gospel Missions are important. When we first got here, there were 
all kinds of missions, pictures of all kinds of missionaries that were all over the hallway. And so we removed them. And what our ultimate goal is, we would love to have a missions kiosk, if you will, a touch screen to where you can go and you can see firsthand on the screen, here's the world, and oh, here's a little dot here. Well, the little dot represents, we've got a missionary right there, and you, you touch that, and it opens up, and it has our, our missionaries right there, and they will give you a greeting of what's happening, what the need is, the current need is right there. You see, we've got projects. How many know that projects take time? Projects take time. Projects take money. So if you notice something that has gone missing, most likely we are working on a project. And projects take time. And can I tell you, missions, it's on the forefront of it all. Amen? If you're with me, say, uh uh-huh. Number three, we value generosity. What I found in my 25 long years of life is that you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. And we've got to give to God our time, our talent, and our treasure in everything that we do. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 25 tells us this, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. We can't outgive God. And can I tell you, there was, there's been such a stigma about pastors talking about money because, well, that's all they want. They all, they all want money. Friends, can I tell you? God will take care of everything, but I will tell you this. I have missed out on blessing people over 20, I wouldn't say 27 years of of ministry, but at least 25 because I was so worried about what people would think about giving. And and I'm robbing people from teaching them about God's blessing upon people who give. And it's not going to be too much longer down the road. I'm going to be using every single one of you as a church-wide illustration within the service of what it means to be generous and doing your part. I'm going to use all of you as an illustration one of these days in a service and show you, and your eyes, can I tell you, your eyes will be open to the truth. God wants us all to be faithful, not just a few. If you're with me, say, "Uh uh-huh. So we value, we value generosity. The Bible tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. We value generosity at Lima first. Number four, not only do... We value the presence of God and missions and generosity, but we also value excellence. Excellence. How many perfectionists do I have in the room? There's a way out of that, can I tell you? There's a way out of it. How many would say, I can do it and no one does it better than me? Come on, somebody, don't be liars. We're going to have to have a service for lying. You know what I'm talking about, right? We get this mentality that it's got to be perfect, and if it's not perfect, we might as well just throw it in the trash. Can I tell you, we'll throw everything in the trash then because nothing will ever be 100% perfect, right? So there is a difference between a standard of excellence and a spirit of perfection, None of us will ever reach that until we get to him. None of us will ever reach that until we all change in the twinkling of an eye and we're with him. None of us will ever reach perfection. But excellence is different than perfection. Excellence is simply this, giving God our absolute best. Giving God our absolute best. Colossians chapter 3 
Verse 23, it says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord and not people. You're doing it for him. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. We do it as unto him. Now that raises the bar, doesn't it? Or I should say it should. A guy by the name of Ralph Marston says this, excellence is not a skill, it's an attitude. Can I say that again? Excellence is not a skill, it's an attitude. I would rather have someone with a great attitude working with a standard and a spirit of excellence that it might not be just exactly how, but it's done with the right heart, it's done with the right attitude, right? than it is to have, all right, just give it to me. Let me get it done. You know, I would just, I would rather, you with me? So a standard of excellence. Ecclesiastes, verse 9 and 10. Whatever you find to do with your hands, do it with all of your might, because there is neither work nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom in the grave, the place where you will eventually go. <laughs> It's like, wow, you better do it right now because sooner or later we're all going to be taking a dirt nap, right? Come on, do it right. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing with a standard of excellence. Number five, what else do we value here at Lima First? We value service. Service. Service with a smile. In other words, it's faith in action. We serve our church. We serve our community. We serve our world. From time to time when, when tragedy happens and, and natural disasters happen, we will sometimes take a special offering, right? We are serving our world. We may not be able to be there, but we can lay, leave a footprint that, that, that we're giving towards this, we're helping. I would love to develop and see this is where I get in trouble. I'll start saying stuff from the pulpit, and my wife goes, she, did you just see what she did right there? She just did this. She didn't even look up. She's taking notes. Hey, listen, you're not the boss of me. I'm sorry. I'll buy you ice cream today. Listen, serving, I would love it when natural disasters and something happens, those of us who are willing and able, we take off and we go. We got chainsaws. We got, we got equipment. We got a roaster right out here. We can feed the multitudes as they're working, right? I would love to be able to see something like that happen in the near future. Serving. In Mark chapter 9, verse 41, it says, Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Serving people. Serving people. Loving people to life. Not just they annoy me to death. Serving people. How many are sitting next to Don't answer that. In other words, when we're serving, we want to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Serving people. This Wednesday, coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a dream session of what Ritchie Street can look like. This is not just my dream. It's not just uh, Pastor Lori's. It's not the staff's dream. It's just not the board's dream. This is our dream. This is our dream. And sometimes dreams are so big, that, but we got to start here someplace. we got to start here. It's a dream that all of us can have, and it's a dream that we can all press towards. I'm done with that. Say, so move on to number six. Lastly, let me go through them again. We value the presence of God. Everybody say, the presence of God. We value missions. We value generosity. We evaluate. Uh, we, we evaluate. We value excellence. 
We value service. And lastly, we value alignment. Alignment. What is alignment? Alignment is unity. It's teamwork. Alignment is everyone pushing in the same direction. Tony Evans, how many have ever heard of Pastor Tony Evans? Pastor Tony Evans said this, in order to impact our society, we must first model unity in the church. You ever met somebody like that? They want so much to impact their community, but yet they won't even be a part of the body of Christ. It's like mavericks. I'm just going to do it all by myself. Friends, we need each other. I'll show you something God revealed to me yesterday. Alignment. It's okay, I got it, I got it. I, you know, I've, I've got it. I can do it by myself. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's all right, I got it. It's okay, I got it. I don't need anybody. I'm good. This sucker's heavy. But what happens... Go, go to the end. Go to the end there. Push. He's reading the announcements. <laughs> he need to sign up for that. Push. Push. careful that's what we do in church belly up to the bar there friend come on D here you get on this side push <laughs> see you guys aren't as tough as me <laughs> we're not pushing in the same direction what we find is that we're expending a lot of energy. And we're hard at work, but we're not getting anywhere. That's why we have to be aligned. And there's this great misconception within the church that I can't be aligned if I disagree with something. Can I tell you something? The Bible says this in the book of Acts. They were in one room and they were of one accord. But can I tell you, they didn't agree on every single issue. Look forward in the book of Acts. There was a huge uh, uh, issue and discrimination or or, or issue with Paul and Barnabas. And it got so heated, they said, "I'm, I'm unfriending you from Facebook. And they split up and they went the other way. They had a disagreement, can I tell you? They were still pushing in the same direction, Christ and him crucified. Now they came back together. It never did say they got friends on Facebook anymore. But it did say they were working for the Lord together. You see, if we're pushing all in the same direction, Go that, go that way, go that way. Hop on that end. What was very heavy and we're pushing it can be very, very easy now. I don't have to work. You're going to run over everybody on the corner. Well, come on, let's drive, right? Right? You with me? It's very easy to move when we're all 
working together. And that's why we value alignment. And I want to, I just want to point this out. It's just not alignment with one another, but it's all of us in alignment with God. Because if you'll research and you'll study the scriptures, you'll find out there can, there can be an alignment, but it can be a wrong alignment. Look at the Tower of Babel, right? And God said, you know what, i got to put an end to this. And so he scattered them and gave them all different languages and sent them all, all over the world. We want to be aligned with the Holy Spirit. And that's why each and every one of these values works together. Seamlessly together. Amen.